This video is about Thomas Jefferson and his life and his presidency and his relationship with his on-again, off-again friend and enemy John Adams. So let's start by talking about Jefferson's life itself. As many of you already know, Thomas Jefferson is maybe most famous for being the author of the Declaration of Independence. Um, and he also, uh, in that document, wrote, all men are created equal. And at the same time, he owned slaves. And so Jefferson's stance on slavery is a very complicated one. Because at times, he wrote things uh, that clearly showed that he thought slavery was a bad thing. And yet he wasn't willing to give up the slaves that he had in his own life uh, that were making his life a lot easier as they ran his farm at his home, Monticello, that you can see in the picture here. And so Thomas Jefferson's life um, on slave, his, his stance on slavery is a very complicated one because he had slaves and yet he wrote these amazing words, all men are created equal in the Declaration of Independence. He also hired a, a man named Benjamin Banneker to help design Washington, D.C. that would become the um, capital city of the United States. That man, Benjamin Banneker, was a free African American. And so Thomas Jefferson had this very complicated um, stance on slavery, and it's important to remember both aspects of that when we talk about him. As you also know, Thomas Jefferson became the third president of the United States, but he absolutely hated being president. And when he became the president of the United States, unlike George Washington and John Adams before him, Jefferson made uh, being president a little bit more laid back and less official. He would answer the door to the White House in his bedroom slippers and his comfies. Um, and he just kind of... Uh, lived a little bit like uh, he was just a regular old guy uh, when he was president of the United States. However, he did love the finer things in life. He loved expensive wine, and he loved expensive clothing, and he also um, loved his home in Virginia at Monticello that you see in the picture here, and he spent many, many dollars trying to design and redesign it. Um, at his home in Monticello, he also had hundreds and hundreds of books. In fact, the original Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. was made from the books from Thomas Jefferson's library. And so Jefferson had uh, also had at his home many different inventions that he liked to work on. And so he was a very, um, he enjoyed the finer things of life. Well, one thing that is often not talked about with Thomas Jefferson, and we're going to touch on it for a few minutes here, is his family tree. Thomas Jefferson's family tree you can see in the picture here and I think it's um, worth noting a few things here. I want you to go ahead and pause the video and just look at the family tree for about 30 seconds or a minute and make some observations to yourself. Maybe write them down on a piece of scratch paper or just make some observations in your own head. Pause the video right now for about 30 seconds or a minute, take a look at this family tree and then I'll come back and give a few thoughts about the family tree itself. Okay, so now that you've made your observations, let me point out a few things about Thomas Jefferson's family tree. At the top of the family tree, you see John Wales. Okay, John Wales uh, was married to Martha Epps. That was his wife. But he also had a romantic relationship with Elizabeth Hemming, one of his slaves. From his relationship with his wife Martha Epps, he had a daughter named Martha Wales, who was born in 1747. From his romantic relationship with his slave Elizabeth Hemming, he had another daughter uh, named Sally Hemings. Okay, named Sally Hemings. She was born in 1773, as you can see here. Well, here's Thomas Jefferson's parents in the middle, Peter and Jane, and they had their child Thomas Jefferson in 1743. Jefferson was married to Martha Wales, and Martha tragically died in 1782. And you can do the math on that. She was only 35-ish um, years old when she passed away. Thomas and Martha had two children named Martha and Mary, who were born in 1772 and 1778. And um, tragically, one of those girls ended up dying uh, as a young girl as well. Well... If you've already looked ahead and figured this out, you may have noticed that Thomas Jefferson also had a romantic relationship with Sally Hemings, his, sl his slave. And their relationship produced 
four children, as you can see at the bottom of the screen here, and beginning in 1798. Well, Jefferson was elected president in 1800, and so this relationship with Sally was going on um, before that for sure, and the final child, Thomas, was born in 1808 uh, from Sally. Well, if you haven't already noticed, there's a couple of one or two other things that are uh, seem kind of crazy about Thomas Jefferson's family tree here. If you haven't figured this out yet, notice that Jefferson was married to Martha. Now, Martha died in 1782, and um, Sally was only born in 1773. Uh, it seems it, it's it's it is very likely that Thomas Jefferson's romantic relationship with Sally Hemings didn't begin until after his wife Martha had passed away in 1782. However, if you look at the at the family tree here, notice that Thomas Jefferson's wife Martha and his uh, romantic interest after his wife died Sally, his slave, both of them are related to each other. In fact, they are half-sisters because they have different moms but the same dad. John Wales was the father to Sally Hemings and the father to Martha Wales, both of whom had a romantic relationship with Thomas Jefferson. There's one other difference to really, one other big thing to point out here if you haven't already noticed it, and that is Thomas Jefferson's age versus Sally's age. Jefferson was born in 43, Sally was born in 73. Yes, that's right. Sally and Thomas were separated by 30 years. Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings' relationship probably began when she was about 18 and he was about 48 years old. Okay, um, William Beverly was born in 1798. Okay, in 1798, that was the first child that Sally had from Thomas Jefferson, which means at that point, she was about 25 years old, um, 25 or so years old, because she was born in 73, he was born in 98, so if you do the math there, that's about 25, so their relationship began sometime before 1798, and um, lasted until Thomas Jefferson died. Sally was by his side when he passed away. Unfortunately, Thomas Jefferson never admitted to his relationship, never admitted publicly to his relationship with Sally, and um, their children were still, um, some of them were still treated as slaves, which is uh, unfortunate that Thomas was not able to uh, move past that. So that's a little bit about his family tree. Well, when Thomas Jefferson died, he only wanted three things put on his tombstone. Three things and three things alone. Number one, he wanted to be remembered as the author of the Declaration of Independence. Number two, he wanted to be remembered as the author of the Statute of Religious Freedom for Virginia, which um, was a document that he had produced for the state of Virginia. And it's a document that we use today when the uh, Constitution and the courts look at issues of separation of church and state to make sure that your freedom of religion is always respected. And finally, he wanted to be known as the founder of the University of Virginia that he uh, helped build and, and design as an architect. But notice what wasn't on his tombstone. He did not want President of the United States put on to his tombstone because he actually hated being president that much. Well, the final thing that we're going to talk about in this video is Jefferson's relationship with John Adams. You see, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, they showed up in 1774 to the First Continental Congress together as, um, uh, together as delegates from their respective colonies. Jefferson was from Virginia, John Adams was from Massachusetts, and they immediately became friends. Uh, they immediately uh, began to talk and have a lot of similar uh, stances on what we should do about our uh, the the colony's relationship with Great Britain. And in fact, when it was decided to form a committee to write a Declaration of Independence, both John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were on the committee, along with Ben Franklin and several others. And so they formed this bond in 1774, 75, 76. They formed this bond of friendship together. And that bond continued when they were both ambassadors to France in the late 1770s and uh, in the 1780s. And um, 
this bond continued until the establishment of the first political parties that we've been learning about, the Democratic Republicans and the Federalists. Adams sided with the Federalists, Jefferson sided with the Democratic Republicans, and in the election of 1800, John Adams was running as a Federalist, Thomas Jefferson was running as a Democratic Republican, and Jefferson won the election, and John Adams was so upset about the situation that he actually left Washington, D.C. in the middle of the night on the night of the inauguration and did not attend Thomas Jefferson's um, election, his inauguration the next day. And there was a lot of other things that happened between them. Uh, Jefferson uh, gave some salacious material to newspapers that made John Adams look bad, and Jefferson disagreed with John Adams on the Alien and Sedition Acts and some other things that came along, and John Adams felt like Thomas Jefferson didn't support him as his friend uh, when Adams was president. So you had all of these things going on, and, and eventually they just kind of had this falling out and didn't talk to each other from 1800 until 1812, when a friend of both of them, Dr. Benjamin Rush, got them back together and said, you two need to talk to each other. You need to work this out. And so they never actually physically saw each other again in their lives, but beginning in 1812, they began to write letters back and forth to each other. And the initial letter said, we cannot let each other die until we've explained ourselves to each other. We need to, we need to explain our positions to each other. And so over the next 14 years, they began to write these letters back and forth to each other. And it was really a cool thing as a friendship rekindled, but they still had this competitive rivalry. And Jefferson would write letters to Adams that would say things like, hey, how's it going? Here's this new thing I invented. Check it out. And then Adams would write back to Jefferson and say, that's great. Let me talk. Let me tell you about how uh, amazing my crop yield was this year on my farm in Massachusetts. And they would just kind of do these brags back and forth to each other like, uh, hey, that's cool. I did this thing that's better. Or, hey, that's cool. I did this thing that's better. And they had this relationship back and forth with each other. It was this competitive rivalry between the two of them. And that lasted all the way up until they both died, which was on the same exact day. John Adams and Thomas Jefferson both died on the same exact day, July 4th, 1826, 50 years to the day from the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Coincidence? Maybe. Illuminati? Maybe. That's up for you to decide. But both of these men died on the exact same day, July the 4th, 1826. And on that day, Thomas Jefferson had Sally Hemings by his side, and he passed away in the morning on July the 4th, 1826. And Adams had his family surrounding him. His wife, Abby, had already died years earlier, but Adams had his, his children and his grandchildren around him, and they're by his bedside. And as he's laying there, and he's about to take his last breath, he looks around and he looks at his family and before he dies he lays there and he looks up at the ceiling and in the spirit of this relationship and this friendship and this frenemy relationship they've had him and Thomas Jefferson he looks up at the ceiling and he clenches his fist and he says Jefferson lives he's so upset that Jefferson has outlived him that he yells out Jefferson lives as he's about to pass away well, Adams passed away, but what he didn't know was that 400 miles away in Virginia, Thomas Jefferson had already died earlier that morning. So Adams' last thought as he goes to the grave is that Jefferson has outlived him, when in reality, Jefferson had died several hours earlier that same day. And it's kind of fitting that both of these men, who were so important to our country's founding, die the exact same day on the anniversary of the signing of one of our most important documents as a country. And the, co the competition between these two men is so fitting of what we as, an, as a country are and the American spirit and this idea of trying to better yourself and trying to compete and, and do better for your life and find a better life. And so Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, they give us a lot to learn from um, as Americans. So um, that's it for this video. If you have any questions, let me know.